how many people are birders and interested in bats. Uh, so uh, we're delighted to uh, prepare this information for you and, and present it for you today. And, and hopefully this isn't our only interaction uh, that our paths will cross again uh, in the future, hopefully in person, uh, so we can continue our journey about learning about each other's taxa. So did you want to introduce yourself a little bit more, Kathleen? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Kathleen Slocum. I am, uh, I work with data at the Desert Research Learning Center with the National Park Service. Um, and I took Janet's survey techniques back bat survey techniques course in 2015, back in the beginning of my um, park service batting days. And uh, since then, I have been both a student and a hired gun for her contract work and helped teach workshops on trapping and acoustic techniques. And before that, I was an outdoor adventure educator and guide. So I'm coming up in the world. Um, so yes, I've been working with Janet since about 2015, but she has a little bit of a jump start on me for bat work. Just a little <laughs> bit, yeah. Um, I originally started my bat work with uh, Bat Conservation International in Austin, Texas. I worked in their education department and their founder and executive director, Merlin Tuttle. Uh, and I put together a very ambitious training program. Uh, he was out doing a lot of photography and we needed permits from both Arizona Game and Fish and New Mexico. And when we went to apply for our permits, they said, oh, could we come with you? We have no idea how to catch or handle or identify bats. And so we thought, hey, there might be a little niche for uh, teaching other people survey techniques for bats. And that was back in 1989. And I have been doing essentially the same thing ever since. After Merlin left Bat Conservation International, um, I formed my own consulting company and have done uh, over uh, 270 training workshops since then and have educated over 3,000 students, uh, mostly adults, uh, entirely adults, uh, and wildlife biologists, ag agency biologists, and the survey techniques and the monitoring that we use for bats. It's, it's kind of a niche market and not a lot of other folks who take wildlife degrees get a lot of chance to be out in the field with bats. Uh, so we run classes, we used to run classes in person uh, all across the country using a lot of National Park Service lands. Uh, we had classes at Lava Beds National Monument in California, um, Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky, we're down at the Southwestern Research Station in the Chiricahuas here in Arizona. Uh, we work in Florida. We used to work in Pennsylvania. Uh, so I've been doing this for close to 30 years now. And in conjunction with teaching other students how to survey for bats, I've collected a lot of my own survey data. And so we have capture data and now acoustic data uh, from countless states and countless um, natural areas across the country. And so what Kathleen and I are gonna do right now is we're gonna share with you folks uh, some of the interesting things about bats and some of the challenges they present in um, surveying and monitoring. And then also provide you with just a little bit of information uh, on how if you wanna get more interested in working with bats or studying bats or just simply attracting them and enjoying them in your own backyards, uh, we're going to give you some tips and tricks for that. So the information we're going to present is, is very, very broad, uh, but not terribly deep, because we could present a week-long workshop on each one of these uh, concepts. So we're going to make this transcript of our program available to you as a download, a PDF document that includes photos and uh, kind of a narration, maybe what we expected to say. Uh, we'll have a link for that where you can take that off of my FTP site if you're interested. And uh, hopefully it will encourage you to uh, venture out and, and look at bats while you're out there maybe looking at owls or something in the future. Yeah, think of them as a night bird or birds as a day bat. Yes. Um, I'm a scientist though, so I, I know these things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, shall we, shall we begin? Yes, let's go ahead and begin. The screen share part of the presentation will be a treacherous high wire act. Yes. 
but we shall succeed. We shall succeed. What am I sharing? I Desk have to comp. share that one. Two. Two. Mm, um, desktop two. Must hit present mode. Play. Yes. Okay. It looks like it looks yeah. like we've got it. Okay. It's it's good. <laughs> All righty. Cool. Well, we are so fortunate to live in Arizona because it is home to some of the most fascinating species of bats. And we're also really blessed in that we have a pretty mild climate, so we can encounter most of them year round. Uh, yet because they're active mainly at night and they fly around through the dark skies and they're largely silent, especially to our ears, uh, they're pretty difficult to observe. And so they make for some of the most challenging taxa of watchable eye life on Earth. Uh, yet when you make the effort, you are rewarded with glimpses into the secret world of some of the most, I think, amazing animals that we have. Uh, so this presentation is going to acquaint you with many of our backyard bats. And because we're kind of in a subtropical location, if you live anywhere uh, east or west of the Great Plains, uh, you probably have some of these bats in your area as well, even up in Alaska. Uh, so uh, hopefully this will spark some, some interest for future study for all of you. Uh, first off, a, a little bit of basic bat facts. Uh, bats are a very old order of mammals. According to the fossil record, they've lived on our planet for over 50 million years. And fossils show that they have been mostly unchanged morphologically, down to the tiny little bones in their inner ears. Uh, they probably used echolocation to navigate through the primordial swamps of the Eocene, right around the dawn of mammals. Uh, today, there are over 1,100 species of bats. They make up almost a quarter of all mammal species, and they live all across the globe on every continent, except, of course, Antarctica. And like most animals, uh, the species diversity increases as we reach the regions near the equator. They're also probably one of the most successful radiations of mammals. They exhibit almost every kind of mammalian feeding strategy and every variety of mammalian reproductive strategy. They're also found in every biome except for the most extreme desert and polar environments. And the majority of bats eat countless varieties of insects, but they've also evolved other feeding strategies too. Some feed on fish or on frogs or on small vertebrates like birds, unfortunately, and also they will eat other smaller bats. Uh, some bats uh, have evolved to eat fruit or to drink flower nectar. Uh, many of the nectar feeding bats will consume pollen to get a source of protein. And there are three different species of vampire bats that feed only on the blood of other animals, birds and mammals. Over two thirds of our bat species use high frequency echolocation in order to navigate through the night skies and in the pitch blackness of caves. They also use this echolocation to identify and capture their insect prey or to find other food resources. And echolocation is actually a super sophisticated way of using sound. Uh, scientists are still trying to figure out uh, what bats are doing. Uh, if bats could listen to what we think they're doing, uh, they'd probably laugh at us because our abilities to process sound information are so rudimentary compared to theirs. Uh, it's a very precise um, way of navigating and it's got a much higher what we call duty cycle than the submarine sonar from which it is most commonly compared. We could spend uh, an entire hour talking more than an hour and talking about the marvels of echolocation and also how it relates to one of our specialties, uh, acoustic monitoring. But again, it's just one of the amazing abilities that make these creatures so endlessly fascinating. So we will move on Thank to you. a new subject. Uh, one thing we also think about bats is that they're all nocturnal and uh, that they may in fact be blind because like many cave adapted animals, they don't really have a, much of a need for sight. But all bats have eyes and they see quite well, uh, even better than humans. 
Uh, most species of bats, especially the 300 or so species of what we call flying foxes that live in the old world tropics, are very diurnal. Uh, they are very active during the day. They roost out high in the treetops of large emergent trees, uh, and they're very, very gregarious and, and easy to see. Uh, even in the United States, bats are sometimes seen outside during the day. Uh, they will fly around to switch roosts during the day, and especially in our very hot summers, they will come out to get a drink uh, to rehydrate. Yeah, you'll see this, especially here on the bike path uh, underneath like the Pantano and Broadway Bridge. Um, and this is no cause for alarm, usually, most of the time. They are just out there doing what they would be doing normally, but under the cover of darkness. Uh, one of the most interesting facts, I think, about bats, um, besides their echolocation, is that even though they're warm-blooded mammals, uh, they are what is known as heterothermic. Uh, that is, they don't maintain a constant body temperature. Uh, this is a really interesting adaptation that is shared by few other mammals, uh, with the notable exception of naked mole rats that also uh, practice the same type of thermoregulation. Uh, being heterothermic allows bats to colonize a lot of habitats in the subtropical and temperate regions of our planet. They let their body temperature fall to that of their surroundings so they can survive periods when food resources are not available uh, during the winter uh, or uh, even during the unsettled weather in the spring and the fall. This lets them to live off of their fat reserves by drastically reducing their metabolic output. Uh, when bats are hibernating, they're actually selecting for the coldest possible locations that are protected from sub-freezing temperatures. For bats, being too warm during hi hibernation actually threatens their survival. Here in Arizona, we have about 28 different species of bats, more than any other state except for Texas. Um, yet in southern Arizona, within a five mile radius of the Southwestern Research Station in the Chiricahuas, there are 21 documented species of bats, making it the most bat rich location in the US. In Texas, you have to span the entire state to be within range of its 32 species. And Texas is big. <laughs> Many people also associate bats with caves, and they're actually surprised to learn that we have bats that rarely, if ever, will enter caves. In fact, not all bats really need to have caves in order to survive. So let's meet some of our local Arizona bats, uh, many of which, like I mentioned earlier, can be found throughout the Western United States. Almost all of them are insect eaters, but there are three species that survive only on flower nectar and on fruit. Most of our Southern Arizona bats will migrate into the area in the spring, and they'll stay all summer long before finding a place to hibernate in the fall. Or they will migrate further south uh, where they can remain active during the winter without being subject to freezing temperatures. But there are a few species that hang around all year and use short periods of torpor if it happens to get really cold. So like this weekend, when it warms up, uh, we may have some bats flying around at dusk. Many of our Arizona bats are hardwired to seek out roosts in caves and other rocky resources. Uh, some of them form very large populations, uh, but others are really quite solitary and they're really hard to see or, or to come across. In Arizona, though, the cave myotis is one of the species that congregates in the largest numbers in our area caves. Uh, tens of thousands of bats can live in a single location. These bats use caves both in the summer and in the winter. The most well-known roost is the summer maternity population of a couple thousand bats at Karchner Caverns in the Whetstone Mountains outside of Benson, Arizona. The bats can rear young in this cave because it has warm air traps that form incubator-like conditions. And this allows the pups, the baby bats, to grow and develop very rapidly. But in the winter, the bats have to leave Karchner Caverns and find a cooler roost so that they can hibernate. Uh, the Karchner bats probably go uh, to higher elevation caves in the Huachuca Mountains. Uh, there's one cave that's known there that has a hibernating population of about two or 3,000 cave myotis in it. 
And then there's the formerly endangered lesser long-nosed bat. It's one of our nectar bats. Uh, they use caves, but many populations are also found in old abandoned hard rock mines throughout Western Arizona. Uh, they live throughout uh, Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico where they've been protected for decades. And it's one of the things that allowed them to be taken off the endangered species list here in the US. But there are a lot of bats that use rock resources that live in cliff crevices associated with the mountainous regions of the Western United States. Uh, these bats congregate in much smaller numbers and they're more widely distributed across the landscape. They're much harder to protect because of this and population declines are much harder to notice. One of these tiny bats is the canyon bat of Arizona and you'll see it flying around at dusk a lot in, uh, in Tucson. Um, and our personal research in the Chiricahua Mountains has shown a precipitous decline in captures over the past 20 years. Um, as you'll see from the graph, we used to catch more than six canyon bats per net night back in the early 90s. But for the last decade, we've caught less than one per net night. So pretty steep. Pretty steep. Not all bats roost high in cliff crevices. Some species, like this long-eared myotis, will roost right out on the ground in vast expanses of talus slopes on the mountainsides. These features are really common in the Western United States and both in the Allegheny and Appalachia Mountains of the East. Other species of eastern myotis use these similar roost types as well. These bats usually always roost singly. It's just an individual bat or a female bat with her single pup. Uh, they switch from warm southern exposures in the summer to colder northern exposures in the winter. Then there are bats that don't roost in caves or mines or rocky resources at all. Uh, collectively, we call these tree bats because they roost in tree cavities. Uh, either natural cavities that form in old trees uh, or in cavities that are excavated by other animals like woodpeckers. Uh, some of them will roost beneath exfoliating bark on snags uh, or on very old growth trees. And then there are some tree bats that roost right out in the open in amongst the foliage. We don't think of the desert southwest as having a lot of tree resources where cavities or crevices beneath bark can form, but we do have several species of columnar cacti and abandoned woodpecker holes and these plants often become homes for bats. At least half a dozen different species have been observing, observed roosting in saguaro boots. So the next time you're out hiking in the Sonoran Desert at dusk and you see bats, they might be coming out of the cactus. And throughout the West, riparian areas are full of deciduous trees that are absent elsewhere. Uh, this is excellent real estate for many of our tree bats that like to hang out in the foliage of broadleaf trees. Trees like cottonwoods or sycamores or aspens and even um, introduced eucalyptus. And even though uh, the red bat appears really brightly colored in contrast to the green leaves of its favorite trees, uh, it is actually rather cryptic and hanging from a single foot by day, it can look just like a little dead reddish brownish leaf. One of the most common tree bats in Southern Arizona is the Western yellow bat, uh, which looks a lot like the red bat, but a yellow version. This bat makes its home in the dried fronds that hang down from the wild palm trees. In suburban areas of Tucson and Phoenix, where palm trees remain untrimmed, this bat is finding more living space and possibly increasing in population or expanding its historical range. Palms near swimming pools and watered gardens or lawns provide bats with a drinking source and insect diversity as well. Yellow bats will also roost in the dried yucca skirts in more rural areas and in mid elevation deserts. And if you guys are familiar with Tucson, you'll notice that this is uh, Agua Caliente Park, which you can go to to see yellow bats. But the bats that we're most likely to notice first on the landscape are those that we call generalists. Uh, these are bats that can roost almost anywhere, uh, and a lot of them have decided that our homes and our bridges and other construction projects make mighty fine homes for them as well. Uh, bats will roost in attics and garages and barns and, and porch areas, uh, but increasingly they will also roost under concrete bridges or concrete stadium stands. 
especially in the joints between the concrete box beams or the I beams that are used in that kind of construction. Bats generally prefer quiet roosts, so they tend to choose structures that don't have a lot of daily human activity, uh, places like barns uh, or buildings that have been abandoned by humans. Uh, and unfortunately, as these abandoned buildings fall into disrepair and no longer provide toasty warm roosts, the bats will lose an important resource on the landscape. Uh, bat boxes can provide a useful option for homeless bats, uh, but not just any wooden box will do. We've learned over years of experimentation that bats like certain features in a man-made roost. Uh, bat houses need to be tall and wide and provide appropriate temperature profiles. They should be sturdy, uh, made from heavy wood or materials that don't crack and warp with the weather. And uh, we're finding out that a four inch landing pad below the house helps the bats to navigate into the open bottom. You don't have to build your own bat house anymore. A uh, Pennsylvania company called Bat Conservation and Management sells nearly maintenance free PVC plastic shelled houses. The PVC provides a nice um, exterior that's weather resistant uh, and it covers an interior that is full of wooden roost baffles and they've been very successful at attracting bats across the country. They're painted in different shades uh, so that in northern climates uh, the darker colors will absorb solar heat and, and warm up and in, uh, light, in uh, hotter climates like uh, Tucson the lighter color uh, will prevent them from overheating. Uh, so this is a really great resource. In fact, bat house science, so to speak, was actually pioneered in Pennsylvania. And today there are more bats in the Northeast that form summer colonies in man-made roosts than live in natural roosts. A lot of these are in backyards and a lot of bat house owner owners have been uh, contributing to a regional database managed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Participants are asked to count the bats three times a summer and turn their data into the commission. And in this way, the management agency gets a good picture of the total bat population in the area and if it's stable uh, or if it's changing from year to year. Bat house use in the Southwest where we are is less well understood. About 15 years ago, I worked with the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum here in Tucson to study what kinds of bat houses worked best in our challenging climate. Uh, we often experience uh, great temperature extremes uh, during the summer between uh, sundown and sunrise, and it makes it difficult to accommodate bats in small bat houses. And what we found here in Tucson was that bat houses on buildings worked far better than those on poles like in the Northeast. Uh, the buildings help to buffer the bat houses against temperature extremes much better than a small house on a pole. And installing more than one house at a single location helps to provide different sizes of roosts and different colors of roosts. Uh, some darker roosts will warm up faster in the spring and then bats can move to the lighter roosts uh, that maybe are more shaded so they don't overheat in the summer. Uh, today, bat houses are being successfully used across North America. I have a publication that I will give you a link to uh, that has general information about accommodating bats with bat houses. Uh, it'll be an excellent place to start if you're interested in uh, working on a bat house building effort of your own. Uh, or you can uh, check out the example at the Audubon Research Ranch in Elgin, Arizona. Uh, the bat house on the west facing exposure of their barn has successfully attracted a maternity colony of big brown bats. And this house is ideal. It's wide and it's tall, and it provides a single one inch roosting crevice. It's very simple. It's um, just two sheets of plywood that are separated by a, a spacer, and it's painted to match the barn. So it's pretty unobtrusive. Plus it's located right next to a permanent water source, a concrete cattle trough. And in our arid climate here in Southern Arizona, this is really essential. 
Uh, it's also essential in this grassland habitat, which doesn't have a lot of other roosting resources for bats. Uh, bats are a lot like people. They like to have their homes that are conveniently located near food or water. And so instead of roosting in the faraway mountains, now they can live on the ranch itself and take advantage of the insect diversity here without having to travel long distances from their homes. Often though, living with bats is seen as a risk, especially from rabies, a fatal disease that any mammal can contract. Um, so if you're putting up these bat houses, it's a good thing to keep in mind, but hopefully some information we have will not deter you from doing so. Um, rabies is passed on to other animals and humans, mostly through bites. Uh, there must be contact with the virus shedding saliva of the infected animal to the blood or mucous membrane of the victim. Rabies from bats is very rare and uh, human contracted rabies um, is much more common in the United States uh, through vectors such as fox, skunks, raccoons, and dogs. Um, bats don't seem to contract a furious form of rabies with the frothy mouth and the aggression. Um, also, unlike foxes and skunks or many other animals, outbreaks that decimate a population of bats is unheard of. Only 20 some people in the CDC records uh, have died of rabies contracted from bats. Um, and if you compare that to other sources of mortality, such as car crashes or domestic violence or bee stings, um, it's really not that big of a number. Um, so if you're not afraid of driving, getting married or having wildflowers in your backyard, uh, you really shouldn't be afraid of attracting bats. Um, but rabies is a real threat and shouldn't be treated lightly. So there are a few um, simple and important facts to help keep you and everyone around your bat house safe. Always keep your dogs and cats current on their pre-exposures, pre-exposure vaccines, um, and always warn children and others about not touching bats or wildlife that are within reach. Uh, with these facts in mind, backyard bats can be really an enjoyable, safe, and interesting, watchable wildlife resource. And don't forget that your backyard bats like to drink and providing them with reliable water resource uh, will go a long way in keeping them around. Uh, but also remember that bats have to drink on the wing. So they need a large source of calm pooled water so they can essentially do a touch and go landing to get a sip. And like different types of airplanes, different species of bats need longer runways. So large or easily accessible water sources are better. And finally, especially with man-made water sources, the water must be maintained. I have colleagues who have done studies throughout the arid west, and they found that when water levels in tanks fall too low, like the picture in the lower right-hand corner, bats have to use up to 10 times more energy to access the site. And some species don't even have the wing morphology to allow them to attempt to do this. So they have to find an alternate water resource. The best man-made water resources are rehabilitated springs, like the several that are maintained on the Audubon Research Ranch in Elgin. These water sources were created initially to protect the Chiricahua leopard frog, but they were designed with bats and other wildlife in mind as well. I've done um, several summer surveys out at the ranch, and we've confirmed that at least 12 different species of bats depend on um, and visit these water resources. Historically, the American beaver was a great niche maker and maintained lots of open water resources when constructing its dams and flooding meadows or creating oxbows and rivers. And even in the 1890s, they were common in the Santa Cruz River that used to flow through Tucson. But trapping decimated populations throughout the Southwest in the late 1990s, though, the Bureau of Land Management and the Arizona Game and Fish Department spearheaded a movement to reintroduce beaver to the San Pedro River in southern Arizona. The reintroduction was wildly successful, and the beaver have dramatically improved the health of this stream. It slows down the water, especially during the monsoon season, and it created more drinking, foraging, and roosting habitat, not just for bats, but for a whole host of native wildlife. 
Including birds. Including birds, yes. So you can learn a lot more about accommodating bats with managed water resources. Uh, Bat Conservation International has a free publication with all of the how-tos available for download uh, from their website. But really, I think the most fascinating bats that we have in southern Arizona are the nectar feeding bats. Uh, these bats pollinate the flowers of some of our most ubiquitous plants, uh, especially the saguaro. Uh, they are said to have a keystone impact for this plant as well, meaning that if it were not for the bats and their pollination services, whole hosts of other animals and habitats would suffer. Uh, all of our uh, saguaro uh, open up their flowers at night. Uh, they do stay open during the day to kind of hedge their bets with um, avian pollinators, but their bright white flowers are specifically bat adapted. Uh, they're born high on the stalks and the tips of the plants, and they're perfect targets for the night flying bats. The flowers are also precisely proportioned to accommodate the bat's head and they provide a plentiful nectar reward as the bat thrusts its head deep within the flower. When they reach for the nectar at the base of the flower, they become covered in pollen and they inadvertently transport the pollen and the saguaro's genetic material across large distances of desert as it feeds. And without the pollination services, the cacti would not produce fruit. And the saguaro fruit ripens during our forest summer at a time when there's little other moisture on the landscape. And this makes saguaro fruit a critical resource to many animals, including bats, but also num numerous species of birds and rodents and insects, arthropods, and even native humans. But unlike many of the cacti fruit consumers that feed directly at the plant, like this Gila woodpecker, the bats fly in for a quick mouthful of fruit and then cross large areas of desert to return to their roosts in the distant mountains each morning. In doing so, they drop seeds along the way, many of which have a greater potential to fall in a site where germination and survival chances are higher. So even though many animals visit saguaro flowers and eat saguaro fruit, the bats are especially critical to its continued survival. The bats also pollinate the flowers of the cardone and the organ pipe cactus. And they're similarly important to the biology of these plants and to the animals in the habitats where they occur. These same species of bats also pollinate several dozen species of native agave plants. Uh, throughout their range, these bats migrate annually along a nectar corridor from southern Sinaloa to southern Arizona, a route that is about 1,000 kilometers one way. Uh, they follow a succession of blooming plants to fuel their journey uh, from tree morning glories to various agave species to the columnar cacti. And protecting these nectar resources throughout these areas is essential to protect the fuel these bats need for their travels. Um, there are two species of nectar bats that live in Arizona, the lesser long-nosed bat, Leptonycterus yerba buena, and the Mexican long-tongued bat, Caronycterus, Caronycterus mexicana. Both are essential, essential to the pollination and biology of columnar cacti and agave, especially the blue agave from which tequila is made, and also other agaves uh, that similar liquors are made throughout Mexico. But tequila production requires that the agave be harvested before they flower, um, and large agave plantations in northern Mexico essentially turn from being a land of plenty to becoming nectar wastelands for migrating bats. Thankfully, many tequila producers now understand the importance of bats and the genetic benefits of their pollination services to their agave stocks. So they have started set aside programs, allowing a certain percentage of their agave to flower, fueling the bats migration and preserving the genetic diversity of their crops. A big win win. Um, so just like you can buy dolphin safe tuna, you can now purchase bat friendly tequila. Uh, tequila Ocho is one that is notable and easily available um, in Tucson at several local uh, providers of spirits. Um, and there are several others on the Bat Friendly website in the chat. 
And because these bats like sugary sweet nectar so much, we can get up close glimpses of them in our backyards by putting out hummingbird feeders. Um, of course, bats are harder to watch and are much faster than hummingbirds, uh, darting in for a quick sip and then flying off. But just like our fast food drive through windows, the bats will come back again and again. So patient observations are rewarded with lots of views of these seldom seen animals. And once they key in on feeders, which nobody knows quite how they find these feeders, uh, they can become habituated to porch lights and video cameras and even camera flashes, allowing us to not only get great views of these animals, but also to determine which species are visiting. This is where citizen science for bats gets pretty exciting. Identifying the numbers and species of bats that visit backyard feeders is now an important citizen science project in Southern Arizona. Uh, first started in the town of Morena. It is currently maintained by the Arizona Game and Fish Department and spans the entire Southern Arizona range of bats. Um, information and observation forms can be downloaded from the Arizona Game and Fish website if you'd like to participate. And I'll link to it in the chat. Um, video footage, even from something as simple as a ring doorbell, can help identify, help to identify bats. The long-nosed bat has a shorter nose and almost no tail membrane. It looks like it's wearing pants. In the most common, it is the most common bat visiting feeders in the greater Tucson area. Uh, they arrive here in late summer and sometimes remain until our bitter cold winter weather arrives in November. At first we thought they only visited feeders on the east side of town, but with more monitoring, we have found that they can turn up almost anywhere and recently have made their presence known throughout the Tucson mountains. The long tongue bat has a much longer nose and a shorter tongue <laughs> and a much more obvious tail membrane. So more like it's wearing a skirt. It does not form large colonies like the long-nosed bats, and it appears to roost in very small numbers or be mostly solitary. And they've mostly been observed um, every month of the year in Tucson, so they likely don't make long-distance migrations. Both species of bats appear to use roosts in the mountains surrounding the Tucson Basin, and they will travel up to 25 miles nightly from their roosts to find feeders. Even though long-tongued bats will visit feeders year round, when they join forces with the mobs of long nose bats in the early fall, bats can drain a single feeder in a matter of hours. Sometimes flocks of bats will buzz a feeder, peeling off to take a drink, waiting for their turn until the sugar water is gone. Um, and I'll link to that in the chat. Okay, great. So if you're thinking about adopting a serious bat study, you might consider participating individually or as a group in the North American Bat Monitoring Program. This is a really exciting uh, coordinated effort to collect continent-wide data, and it will allow wildlife managers for the first time to rigorously assess the status and trends of North American bats. It's kind of like our own Christmas bird count that you all have been doing for decades. Uh, we're a little behind the eight ball on this, uh, but it's a very exciting program and I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, in order to ensure that our survey efforts are using good science, the program organizers overlaid over 300,000 10 kilometer square grid cells across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. In the continental US, there are 133,000 grid cells each that has been given a numbered rank from one to 133,000, with one being the highest priority. And the numbering of the cells was done both spatially in a spatially balanced manner, and it was randomized so that bats could be surveyed across all landscapes, not just where they were easy to find or that had really great habitat. The North American Bat Monitoring Program encourages surveys to focus on the top 5% of the ranked cells, and they're indicated by all of the green dots on this US map. So you can see that it does cover a pretty random selection in every state. And this will allow all of our survey efforts to be compared across both time and space. There are over 130 priority cells in Arizona alone. 
And what I find the most interesting is that the Audubon Research Ranch in Elgin is located in one of the top 5% priority cells. And this is a cell that my company has adopted for annual North American bat program monitoring. The monitoring uh, has to take place after the spring migration and before the young of the year become volant. And that's for us here roughly from the 1st of June to the 30th of July. Uh, the main monitoring method uses stationary point acoustics. So you don't have to go out there catching bats. And each one of these priority grid cells is divided into four quadrants, a northwest, a northeast, a southeast, and a southwest. And a single bat detector is placed in each quadrant, and all four need to turn on at the same time and need to run for at least four consecutive nights. Uh, the bat detectors are recording the ultrasonic echolocation calls of the bats, and later on we feed those through a computer assisted analysis program to determine species. And then the computer outputs have to be manually verified and uploaded to the North American Bat Partnership website. Then as the results come in, uh, they're pooled from all the other grid cells that are being monitored. And for the first time, we can see how relative species presence and activity changes on this sort of spatial temporal scale. Uh, and of course, because every survey method is biased, uh, the program also includes other methods uh, to survey for bats. Uh, this includes conducting mobile acoustic transects, where instead of putting out a stationary microphone, we have microphones on the tops of vehicles and we're uh, driving along a predetermined route so that we can sample absolute numbers of bats. And we also uh, provide for summer and winter roost counts in each one of these grid cells. Uh, part of the training that I do uh, for bat survey solutions is uh, to hold some small group trainings in the three NA bat grid cells across Southern Arizona this summer. And this will allow people to receive hands-on experience and I'll be able to teach them the skills that they need to successfully carry out the NABAT monitoring. Uh, they can either adopt one of the Southern Arizona cells that I'm currently using or one of the other hundreds of cells that have not yet been adopted. And of course, this uh, program can be expanded uh, throughout the United States and up into Canada and down into Mexico. So these are really exciting times for us to be working uh, with bats. And we hope that we've given you some ideas for how you can begin to Learn more about our batty neighbors uh, to the extent that you want to be involved. Uh, so feel free at any time after this presentation to reach out to us if you have questions or ideas or if you want to become more involved. Uh, we are all working essentially from home right now and, and both Kathleen and I spend an enormous amount of time connected to our devices and love the distraction of receiving emails uh, from some of our students so that we can help them ascend the learning curve that we've spent many years of blood, sweat, and tears uh, doing ourselves. We don't want you to have to make the same mistakes uh, we did. Uh, we're also, like I said at the beginning, gonna make a transcript of this program available uh, so that you can keep it in your files uh, and uh, you can correspond with us in the future. Uh, if um, you're not jazzed about bats right now, maybe something will present itself later and we'll still be around. Uh, so thanks for listening to us uh, today. Yes, and there were really great questions in the chat, and um, you guys asked a, a high level of questions, so it was not easy to focus on them during the chat, but um, I'd be happy to answer any of that. Like, there were great questions. Cool. Yeah. Let's there were a lot of great questions, but you guys did a great presentation. Thank you so much, Janet and Kathleen. That was fabulous. So yeah, let's see if we can get through some of these. Um, Rosie asked a question right off the bat about, um, no pun intended there, right off the bat. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, that was bad. Uh, white nose bat disease. Um, the white nose disease, I, I know that a lot of people have heard about that and she was wondering if that, uh, how prevalent that is here in Arizona. Yeah, boy, we debated putting that in the program or not because once you go down the white nose tunnel, <laughs> you could be there all day. <laughs> but uh, 
It, it is a, a, a problem, mainly in the Northeastern United States. It is moving further south. It is moving further west. Uh, it has been documented in some bats near the Grand Canyon here in Arizona. Uh, but we are thinking that with our much shorter hibernation season and our much milder winters, that it's not going to have the severe impact that it had in the Northeast. Uh, in the Northeastern United States, some of these bat species are hibernating up to nine months out of the year. And that, that's just a huge time to be living off of six grams of fat. And those are the populations where we've seen the, the, the biggest declines. Uh, they don't have a lot of options for surviving the winter uh, like our bats do down here. Also, those northern bats can only survive in those areas because they congregate in such large numbers. Uh, there are hibernacula in the northeast that had hundreds of thousands, 300,000, half a million, over a million hibernating bats. And when you get that many bats that this fungus can grow on, it's like having a Petri dish and the fungus can just spread and spread and spread and spread. So it becomes really, really terrible. I mentioned the um, hibernating bats in the Huachuca Mountains. There's like one to 2,000 or two to 3,000 bats in, in that single cave. That is so small. And that's one of the largest known hibernacula in the Western United States. Most of our bats are either leaving the area in the fall and remaining active. So they don't have those cold body temperatures that the fungus needs in order to grow. The ones that are hibernating are hibernating at much lower densities. So the fungal load isn't as great either. So they're not becoming as infected. Uh, but there again, because these bats are hibernating in very small numbers, if they are indeed becoming active in the wintertime and flying around the landscape and perishing because they can't find enough food, we'll never know it. Because the only reason we were able to identify this in the East is you had hundreds of thousands of bats that were flying around in February in the snow. And that becomes very, very obvious. You know, if that were happening in the Rocky Mountains, in the Cascades, in the Sierras of California, there's not enough people that are nearby that are gonna notice that going on. And that's one of the reasons why this acoustic monitoring is um, a really good benefit uh, for studying bats is that we're coming up with all this baseline data, uh, not just through the NA bat program, but through several other uh, programs that are out there where we can start to see if there are changes in the relative activity levels from year to year to year in the winter time for people who are doing winter monitoring. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I, I love this part, but also it is becoming a little bit more ubiquitous on the landscape as, as well. Like it's, it was introduced in 2006 yes. to the United States um, from probably Europe, where it is, um, it is part of the uh, environment and um, bat uh, behavior has changed and bat um, genetics have uh, evolved in concert with it. Um, so we are in the process of what has happened, in, what happened in Europe uh, probably thousands of years ago um, now. Like mammals roosting in such large numbers is almost unheard of. Um, now bats are the only species that roost in such large numbers and that doesn't happen anywhere in Europe where the fungus is endemic. So it's a neat time to, it's an unfortunate time, but it's a neat time. To see. Uh, Steve had a, a interesting question. He, when you're talking about echolocation and how bats hear or yeah, uh, he said scientists are finding uh, that what's been thought of as a visual part of the brain is really the special part, and it doesn't really matter whether the input comes through the eyes or the ears. Do you believe that's the case in bats? This can go down so many rabbit holes, <laughs> and also because there are differences in the ways different bats process uh, have their their uh, optic nerve anatomy is different. So there's all sorts of research happening right now, but also. I don't know what rabbit holes you want to go down. So, yeah, that is really true. The um, the bats that echolocate, uh, there's a theory that they that flight in mammals evolved twice. 
once in the micro bats that echolocate and once in the mega bats, the flying foxes that do not echolocate. And a lot of it has to do with the way they process visual stimuli. The flying foxes are a lot more like primates. There's a crossing over between the right eye and the left eye in the midbrain. Uh, so whatever the right eye sees gets processed by the left hemisphere of the brain in flying foxes. But in microbats, they're more like every other animal where there's just a direct process, mm -hmm. right to right, left to left. Um, there have been a lot of papers on um, what it's like to be a bat and how bats perceive their environment and the fact that they can both see and, and hear at this amazing duty cycle is, um, it's, it's, it's beyond what a lot of us can, can appreciate because we can't think about listening to sounds that are 20 to 120 kilohertz. You know, our best hearing is around one to 15 kilohertz. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about the, the snippets of sound that we can react to and process, it has to be about 10 milliseconds long in order for us to register it as a sound. Whereas bats are working between two and five milliseconds long for a sound. So yeah, their abilities are just crazy, crazy yeah. amazing. Yeah. And like I said, if they could listen to me talking about them right now, <laughs> they'd be shaking their heads and saying, oh, poor Janet, she just doesn't get it. Well, someone else had a question about, is that echolo is bat echolocation the same as like what dolphins have? Similar to. Similar. In principle, but just yeah. a different, much different. Like you'll see those pictures of bats that have, that look like there's a car crash on their face. And there are just so many different ornation, like ornations and um, yeah, the, uh, the different ear morphologies, whereas dolphins all kind of have a similar shape and uh, yeah, form and function going on. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but there are some really crazy looking bass out there and it has to do with that. There are. I've, and it has yeah, to do I've with the, the media that the sound is traveling through and, and the frequency of the sound, where the way that sound travels through water, it travels a very long distance before attenuating. The way high frequency sound travels through air, it has a very, very short distance before it attenuates. And so these bats have to be super, super loud. Uh, if we could hear these bats, it would be as loud as a triggered smoke alarm. They're echolocating around 110, 120 decibels. So maybe it's a really good thing we can't hear them. Otherwise, yeah. we probably wouldn't like them nearly as much. Uh, so, <laughs> but they, they, the fact that bats have been on the planet for so long, their prey, their insect prey, has evolved to listen to these high frequency sounds. So the bats have to be loud enough to generate an echo, but not too loud to scare off their prey. So it's this really great arms race that is going on uh, between these bats. Yeah, that's something. Uh, someone had a, a really uh, specific, uh, oh, uh, I just lost my train of thought of the word, but a question about palm trees. So should, um, should we not trim our palm trees because the bats are roosting in there? What's your you take on not... that? And then someone, I guess along with that, someone also had a question about do you know of any training that is done for landscapers when it comes to trimming palm trees and the right time to do it? Yeah, there, you shouldn't trim your palm trees during the maternity season when there might be flightless young present. Uh, thankfully, baby bats grow and develop very rapidly. Uh, they are between four and eight weeks from birth to flight. Uh, so just not trimming them in the summer would be nice, but I know that palm trees and those skirts can become like infestations for things like killer bees and for cockroaches and for things that you might not want to have in your backyards. Uh, but keeping them trimmed up in the wintertime is probably not a big deal, although I do record yellow bat calls year round here in Tucson. Uh, but really, most of these tree bats, when they have this what we call an over dispersed roosting resource, they have a lot of options and they may not return to the same tree night after night after night. They may be following an ephemeral insect hatch. They may be um, adjusting to their own metabolic needs. Uh, so outside of the maternity season, they're very flexible and they have a lot of options. It's just during the maternity season when they tend to be 
more loyal to a single roost for a longer period of time, that's when we don't want to be trimming them. And maternity season is like here, it's uh, early April to late June? You probably okay. mid-May through the end of July. Mid-May through the end of July. I mean, I've lived in different areas. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> These bats, our, our Southern Arizona bats are pretty lazy and they don't like to be cold. They're kind of like me. <laughs> so <laughs> they really reduce their activity. Now further in the, in the Northwest, uh, the bats are a lot hardier and they have a lot shorter seasons, so they have to get out and do their thing. Oh, and also, no, I don't think there is trimming. There is not generally uh, um, trainings for landscapers about bat yeah. awareness. So. But a lot of landscapers, you know, I, I noticed this with the people that I talked to, a lot of landscapers and pest control operators, they're very well informed. And, and they deal with bats a lot. And they're, yeah, they deal with bats a lot. Yeah. and. Um, if they notice, oh my gosh, there's bats in this palm tree, they will go in the Google and they will look or they will call somebody who knows somebody yeah. who eventually passes them on to me or Kathleen. And, you know, they're like, oh, that's what I thought. Okay, I'll do that from now on. So there's a really great, um, most of these people, they want to do a good job, you know, and they don't want to be perceived as being unknowledgeable. So they spend a lot of time uh, making themselves informed. And I see this a lot, especially with pest control operators. But I've talked to my um, my landscaper about uh, bats before, and uh, he is very well informed. I'm, I'm always very surprised that they can find this information and come across it. And, and I'm like, that's great. The stuff that we're doing works. It's getting out there. <laughs> yeah, that's it's good to know that, isn't it? Uh, along the kind of same lines, uh, there is a couple questions about whether chlorine and in swimming pools or like a saltwater swimming pool, are those harmful to bats or do they use those for water resources too? Yeah, most of the backyard swimming pools definitely are being used by bats. And a lot of them actually have lower chlorine content than our treated drinking water that we get from Tucson water. And so probably not affecting them terribly. Uh, the saltwater pools, uh, we have many species of bats that uh, in Baja, California and on the Sonoran coast in Mexico that drink out of the Sea of Cortez. Uh, bats have an amazing ability to deal with things like high salt content, high CO2 contents in the air. Disease load. Disease load. Yeah, you've heard this with COVID, uh, the immune system of a bat. Uh, it may have something to do with this heterothermy, uh, the way that they can really adjust their metabolisms. Uh, we know that there are bats that roost in caves in uh, central Texas where the ammonia concentration is so high that if you or I walked more than five feet in the cave, we'd pass out and burn our mm -hmm. lungs. But these bats live in there all summer long. And they can do this by concentrating CO2 in their tissues to neutralize the ammonia. Uh, so they're just, they're such amazing animals. They're unbelievable. <laughs> so I do not think that chlorine hurts bats. I do not think we have to worry about saltwater pools for bats. We've never seen any evidence uh, in necropsies of downed bats that this is an issue. Uh, people also ask too, uh, this was a bigger question when the lesser long-nosed bats were still endangered. Are we doing a disservice to this endangered animal if we are feeding it sugar water day in and day out? Yeah. Um, I think bats are a lot smarter than humans. There are probably humans that will go to McDonald's day in and day out for their $1.99 value meal or whatever they are these days. And um, the bats will gorge on sugar water, but they will go out and seek natural nectar uh, after a certain amount of sugar high that they're getting. And we know this from people who have studied these bats uh, at hummingbird feeders, and they're showing up with pollen on their faces. We do these special little pollen collectors on the feeders to see what kind of native plants the bats are, are foraging on. And I have a colleague who studied these bats at the Southwestern Research Station for six or eight years while I was teaching uh, my classes down there. And she would go out every day and hunt for blooming agave. 
and she couldn't find any within 100 miles. She was driving up and down mining roads and she was hiking and could not find a single blooming agave. And then when she would take the pollen samples off her feeders that night, there was agave pollen on the, on the feeders. So the bats are finding this stuff much better than we are. So again, they're probably laughing at us saying, oh, these poor scientists, they just don't get it. And in the, and in the desert, I'd be more worried about a lack of water resources in general. It's better for them to have water than to uh, be picky about the water source. Especially with like Pantana Wash and other ephemeral places that used to supply water that no longer supply water. Right, right. But now we have all the golf courses. But now we have all the golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're a little over time, but maybe Sorry. do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure, yeah, this is all okay. we're doing today. All right, cool. Well, um, one question was, what do bat feces, I guess that's guano, right? Uh, right? Accumulating under or around the bat box, any issues with that? Put it in your garden. There you go. Yeah. Maybe don't put it near your uh, oronasal passages and wash your hands after handling it, but I don't think so in general. No, it, it accumulates very slowly uh, for one thing. Uh, you can sweep it up once a week and keep it in a little compost tin and then just sprinkle it by the tablespoon on your house plants uh, or by the measuring cup on your garden. It is very high in nitrogen. Uh, guano from bats was mined in Texas back in the 1800s and shipped to the Central Valley of California and to use for growing agriculture. Uh, so it, it's a very good fertilizer. It wow. can burn plants, though, in high concentrations. So you don't need to use very much of it. <laughs> so, but, you know, if you hang your bat house above, say, a picture window in your backyard, you're going to have little black grains of guano on your picture window and probably pee as well. So be judicious about where you put your bat house. You know, don't put it over your basil plants, maybe. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, Leave also was wondering if you could give some advice. What do you do when you have a bat in the house? Well, most of the times when you get a bat in the house, uh, it, if it's late summer, it's just a crazy juvenile. It's kind of like when your 16 year old gets her driver's license, right? Uh, <laughs> if you just uh, open a door or a window, usually the bat, after taking a few laps around the living room, will notice the fresh air and follow it out. Uh, if the bat lands somewhere uh, that's accessible, uh, not at the top of your 18 foot ceiling, but say like on a stucco fireplace or brick fireplace, or even on some blinds or louvers on your window, if you just put a box or a coffee can over it and then slip a piece of cardboard in between the, the wall and the mouth of the box or the coffee can, then take it outside and put it on uh, maybe not a thorny plant, but put it on the trunk of a Palo Verde uh, or put it on the side of your house or on the windowsill outside, then it will get itself back together and, and move off. Uh, but most of the time, uh, just opening a door or a window uh, will encourage the bat to leave. That that's more good advice. So don't don't follow. Um, I I was just thinking of the scene from The Office. If you've ever watched The Office, where Dwight traps the bat on Meredith's head. That's yes. A whole another story. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't run around swinging a tennis racket after it because you probably won't look where you're going and trip over the <laughs> footstool and break your hip or. I'm right, not the lab. I, I can start worrying that. about breaking my hip. Uh, let's see. What? Let's get to this question. Leah has a small, dark brown, solitary bat roosting on her front door alcove. She's been watching it at all times of day and night, and it doesn't seem to move. And doesn't appear dehydrated. Uh, at what point should she become concerned that it isn't apparently moving? Well, it could just be torpid because it's been cold here. I've been torpid. That's true. Uh, and these bats can stay in torpor for three, four days at a time. Uh, usually their metabolism is so low that they're not burning a lot of fat. They're not um, metabolizing a lot of 
water. So they'll be fine. They'll wake up when it warms up and they'll fly away. Uh, if uh, you're super, super concerned about it, there are a couple of wildlife rehabilitators in town that will take bats and we can put the link on the information that we give you. Uh, they mm -hmm. all have the uh, blessing of Arizona Game and Fish. So they're licensed and uh, they do a fine job. And if you're really super concerned about it, um, but uh, just, you know, be sure that you don't have like an indoor outdoor cat. Very few of us do in, in Tucson, thank goodness. Uh, or that, you know, the neighbor kids don't want to take it home and put it in a shoebox and, you know, force feed it <laughs> or something. <Yeah. laughs> you know, it, as long as it's in a safe place and it's, it's well off the ground, it'll be fine. Uh, you know, there's always the chance too that it could have just run out of energy and, and perished. Uh, when bats are roosting, they have really unique um, tendon arrangements in their, their toes so that when their weight is hanging on their toes, uh, they lock in place so that they don't fall off of a roost while they're sleeping. Uh, in order to leave the roost, they actually have to bend at the knee to take the weight off of their toes so that they can release that tendon so they can take off. So it's not unusual at all to see bats that have been dead for decades mummified on the ceilings of caves uh, out in nature. Uh, wow. So what, so if that's the case for Leah, how long do you give it before you take it down so it doesn't mummify on her? Mm, <laughs> it should be pretty soon that it should be being active and find another roost, I would imagine. Yeah, give it a week or 10 days. Yeah. There you go, Leah. All right. Well, it's supposed to be 80 on Saturday, so hopefully that'll help it. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that time. There are what? a couple of quick, uh, um, there are a couple of really quick questions that we could, that were related, like what kind of, if you don't mind. No, go yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And then Please. I'll I'll lead you into it, Jen. Okay, I said the Western, we said the Western yellow bat. Is this the same as the Southern yellow bat? No, it is different. We actually have uh, four species of yellow bats in the US. We've got the Western yellow, Lazarus anthinus. We've got the mm -hmm. Southeastern yellow, yeah, Lazarus intermedius. We've got the Southern yellow, Lazarus ega. Oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's like in the tip of Texas and maybe in Big Bend. Uh -huh. um, maybe it's just three yellow bats. I think it's just the three yellow okay, bats. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there, different Eastern and Western. Different Eastern and Western. And then there's also the Southern in, in, in Texas. Um, and then there's another one. These are just the low hanging fruits that I saw. Do bats always roost upside down? Our bats always roost upside down, but there are bats in the tropics uh, that roost in unfurling banana leaves and heliconia leaves. And they've got little um, suction cups on their wrists and on their ankles, and they roost heads up. And they're very cute. And they're very cute. The hunter and white bat? The hunter and white bat. Yeah, that roosts in, in leaves. It makes tents. There are several tent making bats that are tree bats. And they chew along the mid ribs of like banana leaves and heliconia leaves that are already unfurled. And it causes them to collapse. And then they have this nice little tent that protects them from rain. Of course, it doesn't last very long, but they kind of move around uh, switching roosts. Those were the low hanging fruits that I saw. So feel free, Luke, to throw any. Yeah, there's let, let, there was one more. Where did it go? What other Lauren native? Asked. What other native plants attract bats? Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't see that one. Yeah, for us, it's just the agave, the saguaro, the organ pipe, and the cardone. Uh, as far as for them to feed off of, but any native plants you have will have um, an insect uh, association that the bats will eat the insects off of. Uh, a lot of our insect eating bats aren't pursuing insects in flight. They're gleaning them off of the ground or off of plants. Uh, so things like um, mesquite beetles, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some other bugs. My bug knowledge is yeah, terrible. Yeah, I know. It's, uh... <laughs> I don't know, any, any amount of moths, anything that hosts, yeah, native, uh, anything that you would plant for a pollinator garden 
is also going to benefit bats. Right, because yeah. our bats will eat your pollinators. Our <laughs> <laughs> and your birds, apparently. No, they will not eat birds here in right. Arizona. Not here. <laughs> Never. Yeah, I think on the Tucson Audubon Habitat at Home page, I think there's some information about plants for bats on there. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, backyard bats, there's also information on DCI uh, regarding this as well, I believe. See, Lauren asked, did the scientific name for leptos change recently? I don't know. <sighs> You know, bat people must be so frustrating for you because you guys have all of your birds named and everybody sticks to those names. Uh, we can't even agree on scientific names, let alone common names, but a lot of bat taxonomy has been undergoing revision now that we have all these new genetic tools and we're finding out just how related or how not related certain bats are that we thought morphologically were very related. But yeah, the Leptonycterus used to be called Leptonycterus kurosawe. Uh, but then they looked at all of the leptonycteris that live um, in the Caribbean, in Mexico, the, the ones that come up here, and decided that they were actually uh, different species. And so our leptonycteris curacao that we used to have is now called leptonycteris yerba buena. Uh, and it's a distinct species from the uh, northern South American species and the Caribbean species. And then there's also Leptonycterus nivalis, which is the greater long-nosed bat that lives just over the border in New Mexico and in the Big Bend region of Texas. And then it essentially, its range is down the eastern slopes of the Sierra Madre Occidental in Mexico. And then our Yerba Buena is along the western slope and into Baja. Looks like I found one more question from Pam. She asked, who identifies the pollen for you? Uh, size study with native bees and the pollen that we find on them. So when you're talking about uh, the agave, couldn't find any agave, but the pollen was from an agave. Right. Apparently pollen ID is quite an art. And uh, I know that when my colleague Katie was doing her research, she sent it out, I believe to California, to a lab in California. Uh, that would look at it for her. And she visited them a couple of times because she wanted to learn the techniques. And she said it would be trying to learn everything about bats before I have to finish my PhD dissertation. So she gave up on the whole pollen thing. But yeah, there, there are pollen labs across the country apparently uh, wow. that you can, you can pay <laughs> to uh, review your pollen if you're a PhD student that's well-funded. <laughs> well funded that's the key <laughs> that's the key <laughs> yeah well i i think i think we got through a lot of the questions thank there you so was... much it, it, oh. what 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 lasting thoughts would you like to leave with us uh just that i'm really super sincere about if you ever in the future have questions about bats you'll have my email and just say you were at this presentation and I will go out of my way to get you the answer to your question. And if I don't know it, I know plenty of people who will. This is very true. I started pestering Janet a while ago and I've continued to. So that's why I'm here today because <laughs> she keeps responding and then maybe she'll feed you too. So <laughs> well, you. I'll be sure when I send out the, the email later today, it'll probably go in two emails. So I, I don't have too many, like if you put too many people on the BCC, it kind of slows everything down. So it'll probably be two different emails. I have many people. Uh, but uh, I'll CC both of you. That way folks have both of your email addresses. So if they have any other lingering questions for bats, they can reach out to you. That's great too. Yeah. And like I said, I'll give you a link on my FTP site for uh, the transcript for this program and for some of the other things we talked about during the program. Cool. So, I jotted down a lot of those links too. So we'll try to okay. get that sorted out. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, everyone, if, if you're still on the call, if you want to take yourself off of mute, it's always fun to just get a verbal thank you shout out. Uh -oh. So go ahead and do that. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much.
was great. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I always like that part. Signing off. We'll uh, be in touch. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you.